food industries produce a huge variety of food. But how do our bodies make use of it? You may be fit, active and in the peak of condition. Or elderly, retired and needing a rest. Or you may be just at the start. But we all have this in common, a digestive system which processes food and passes the nutrients to cells throughout the body. We need it to grow, to be active and to stay healthy. with, how long does food stay in our bodies? Well, it depends on the food and the person, but it can take two or three days. It moves quickly towards the stomach, where it stays for a while, and then moves slowly through the intestines. Food is processed in a number of different parts of the body, and in a variety of ways. First, there's ingestion. The process in which we take food into the mouth and move it down the gullet to the stomach, where it's held for a while and churned. Digestion begins here, but mostly takes place in the small intestine, where absorption also occurs. In the large intestine, water is taken from what's left before the elimination of waste from the body. All this happens when we eat. But what makes us feel hungry in the first place? When we haven't eaten for some time, levels of nutrients in the body go down and some of us get very upset. This signals that we need to eat to keep the body performing properly. A carrot is enough to make this baby happy, but our bodies need a variety of foods and so we eat all kinds. Hard, crunchy, chewy, greasy, liquid. Our digestive system must cope physically with all this and it must also separate out the nutrients the body needs for different foods have different amounts. We take eating for granted, not just the food, but the process itself. When we sit down to eat, we don't think twice about what's happening. But if we tried to swallow most food just as it is, straight off the plate, we'd probably choke. The first act of digestion is a physical one. The teeth and jaws are an efficient machine to alter the texture of food so that it can pass easily down the gullet and into the stomach. You've got three types of teeth. You've got choppers at the front which are very sharp and literally chop the food into pieces. If you've got food like meat which is extremely tough it has to be torn. So you have eye teeth here which will tear the food. You've only got to watch a cat eating its food. But once we've chopped or torn the, tea, the meat up, we have to grind it. We have to grind it on the back teeth here, which we call grinders or molars, and mix it with the saliva so that it can then go on down to be digested. The action of the jaws is part of the process too. Up and down to crunch, sideways to grind. Even the soft cheeks and tongue help by moving food towards the teeth. The whole process is called mastication. But food must be moistened as well. And beneath the tongue and at the sides and back of the mouth are the glands which produce saliva to lubricate the process of mastication. Just the thought of food will sometimes get them working. If you didn't have any spit, 
and you put the food into your mouth, it would stick everywhere and you wouldn't be able to move it around. So the saliva is literally a lubricant, a fluid, which mixes with the food, makes it soft and then enables it to move on down. It also has another function in that there's special chemicals in the saliva which help to start to digest the food as well. The chemical is an enzyme called amylase and it starts the process of breaking down starch into a sugar called maltose. Teeth, jaws and saliva shape the food into a ball, a bolus, which we swallow with a gulp. But after that we do not control the movement of the food. The muscles of the stomach and intestines take over. The gullet is a tube with rings of muscles which can contract or expand and as they do that, they will push the food down the gullet, like a conveyor belt taking it down into the stomach. The muscle action is called peristalsis. That's it there. And it controls the movement of food throughout the body. Here you can see what it looks like as food approaches the opening to the stomach. Here's the stomach, higher in the body than many people think. It's a large sac with strong muscles in its walls. It has a distinctive part to play in the digestive process. Its first function is a physical one. It holds food for two to four hours while the muscles churn it up and break it down. The movement that you see here is continuous. The stomach is contracting the whole time. If you actually put a scope into the stomach, you can see these waves of contraction sweeping down, f churning it up, generally forcing it f onwards towards the upper part of the small bowel, which is called the duodenum. When we examine the lining of the stomach wall, here we're looking back past the endoscope to the stomach entrance, we find that it produces gastric juices. These contain an enzyme called pepsin, and the acid which that enzyme needs to start the breakdown of protein. The acid in the stomach activates pepsinogen, which is an enzyme, into pepsin, which starts protein digestion. And also the acid's got a very important defense mechanism because there are germs all around the nose and the throat and uh, germs on a lot of the things we eat and have contact with. The acid in the stomach is acid enough to kill the germs. And it does actually kill them because there are really no germs in the middle part of the bowel. The mixture of food and gastric juices, which is called chyme, must be moved to the intestines for the next stage of digestion. This is done via a ring of muscles, the pyloric sphincter, which squirts about 12 grams at a time into the upper part of the small intestine, the duodenum. The x-ray clearly shows the folds and ridges on the inside wall of the intestine, and these play an important part in the next stage of the digestive process. Movement of the stomach is involuntary. It's triggered partly by the presence of food, but also by signals from the nervous system. The sight, the smell, or even the thought of food is enough to excite us. Most digestion is done in this six meter long tube, the small intestine. The food has to be moved through it physically and while this is happening, it's also further broken down by enzymes so that nutrients in it can be carried into the bloodstream. In the duodenum, which is 25 centimeters long, chyme is mixed with bile from the liver and with juices from the pancreas, 
and from the duodenum itself. You've got this mixture in the duodenum and then there's a, a lot of enzymes pouring in to, the, to this mixture from the pancreas gland and that's secreting really enzymes to digest fat, protein and carbohydrate as well as the bicarbonate which it produces. Coming also down from the liver, coming in through the same little tube uh, which joins it just before it gets to the bowel, there is bile and particularly important in the bile are these bile salts and they're like a detergent which breaks down fat and helps digestion. It makes the fat small enough to be digested by the other enzymes, by the lipase from the pancreas. Chyme from the stomach is acid and bile can't emulsify fat. That is, can't break it into small droplets in acid conditions. But pancreatic juices contain bicarbonate, which is alkaline. The fat now emulsifies easily because the acid has been neutralized. The main enzymes in the pancreatic juice are amylase, which breaks down starch, lipase, which breaks down fat, and trypsin, which breaks down protein. As the food is broken down, vitamins and minerals are also released. The wall of the small intestine has permanent folds and tiny projections called villi, which make it look and feel like velvet and greatly increase the area in contact with the chyme. So six meters of intestine actually has a surface area of about 30 square meters. Food is in continual contact with this interior wall as it's broken down by the enzymes and moved along by peristalsis. Dietary fiber helps the action of peristalsis because it adds bulk to the food. In the small intestine, the action of absorption takes nutrients from the food into the bloodstream through the walls of the villi, which are one cell thick. The villi themselves are richly supplied with blood vessels, and the absorption, which starts on their surface, works in one of two ways. Absorption can be passive, with substances moving across the lining from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration. That's what the dye is doing here. But the absorption can also be active, with carrier molecules transporting nutrients across the membrane of the lining. But what happens to the nutrients once they are in the bloodstream? Some of the substances are absorbed into lymph vessels and um, they actually go through into the main lymph duct. But the majority goes into veins and those veins drain the blood away from the bowel it goes into larger and larger veins and eventually goes up the portal vein into the liver. So all the, all the blood which is coming from the bowel has to go through the liver. The liver converts nutrients into the substances the body needs. These are carried in the bloodstream and used by cells both to provide energy and the materials they need to function. The final stage of digestion takes place in the large intestine or colon, which is a metre long and acts as a fermentation vessel. Some substances, such as dietary fibre, still need to be processed. So over a period of about 16 hours, the food residues are passed through, again by means of peristalsis. During this time, bacteria ferment the material, producing a variety of products and some gas. The products of the fermentation, along with water, are absorbed, leaving the waste to be eliminated through the anus.
Do you like vegetables? We're lucky to have a wide range of food on offer. And our digestive system must be very efficient to deal with such variety. But can it deal with anything and everything? Do we make the right choices? Our body can only take from food what there is in it. It's up to us to make sure we feed it the right mix of nutrients. Too much fat, for instance, or too little fiber will affect our health. And of course, the body needs a constant supply of fluid from drinks. So what's the answer? We need to have not just one kind of food, but a variety. The variety must contain the right balance. Protein, carbohydrate, fat, vitamins and minerals, fiber, and fluid in all its forms. Eating a variety of foods will provide the body with the energy and nutrients it needs to function properly. And that's something to celebrate. Bye.